w one of the patterns we see is we see islands of automation springing up within customers because you know they want to lessen their toil, they get tired of typing the same things over and over again, a and that's where the, some of the early benefits come. F but but what we see really take off is when those little islands of automation start to get linked together and we start building end-to-end -end, you know service level automation, and that's what our next session is about. So. Thank you, Omar. My name is James Henderson. I am a automation solutions architect with Data Ductus. And we have some experience working in tier one service providers. So I basically want to share some of the stuff we've figured out in doing this. And so let's get with it. Um, we have silos. So in you know, every company, you have to have some silos which are going to help you to organize. Because a very large company, you cannot just have one organization delivering everything. Right here, we have sort of vertical silos. So say like technologies that you're delivering, such IP, uh, so like your maybe IP core, your uh, data center, um, optical transport, mobile private network. So these are each, you know, they each have their own technology stacks, all their uh, complicated things that have to be done operational requirements as well. But then you have to add on to that uh, geographic silos, right? So if you have a, if, uh, you know, the, if you're, each one of these vertical silos will have its own geographic component, right? So you could have, you know, six different data centers in six different parts of the country. Each one of those will have its own organization. If they are each doing their automation differently, you're gonna run into challenges. Um, and then we get into our Net DevOps. So we've talked a bit about how in Net DevOps we have different silos there. We have, you know, network engineering. We have our uh, development, and we have the operations. And those are each all independently hard, difficult things, and they have their own groups doing them, right? And they have to work together. And then finally, for every single one of the things that I've mentioned, you have both uh, business side, and you have like an operations or a delivery side. So that sort of adds an extra level of complexity. I think most of us have run into situations where we know what we need to do, you know, to make the company function as effectively as possible, but uh, we're not quite, you know, we're not authorized to do that because it hasn't been paid for properly or something like that, right? Um, and yeah, we've all run into that. So when you add all this together, <laughs> things, uh, things get a little bit complicated. Because you, you know you have these silos and silos and silos distributed across, and it it and the amount of confusion and the amount of uh, number number of different people and resources you're trying to commute, uh, coordinate is very very high. So how do we get these silos working together? Well, we need some sort of infrastructure. Here is how we can get a whole bunch of people in London able to get where they want to go, and without uh, you know without having just a giant traffic jam. So, but let's take a look at different types of networks. So first we have this network right here. And this one is not too scary. It's a you know, small corporate network, and we don't really need all that many network administrators or anything. This here kind of represents the resources that we might be trying to control with this network. And each one of those dots is a resource, and the lines represent the possible conflicts, right? So even if you have two administrators, you've got to make sure they're not both trying to make changes on the same device at the same time, potentially, or trying to configure the same port, or anything like that. And so, like, but, you know, this is a manageable amount of thing. You can make sure you check each one of those lines when you make a change to one of those dots, and you're okay, right? So you don't really need to have complicated solutions in this case. You can get by with these, as Jan was saying, Jan, Jan had a presentation, he's talking about these five levels of automation, and level one to two, that's in your scripting and all that kind of stuff, right? And you can get away with that when you don't have very much stuff, very many, very complicated network. However, as your network starts to grow, your need for more complicated solutions starts to go up. So here, all we've done is we just doubled the number of dots, but then suddenly you see some extra lines appearing, right? It's still not too bad, but now you have to coordinate things between multiple silos in the company. You have changes that you're trying to do, which kind of have implications or possible connections with other things. 
So we need to have something a little bigger, right? Um, here's where we get into like change and control, some sort of structured automation platforms. But you could still, and we've, like, I've seen it lots, where the company really is still running on one to two level, right? On the, you're, not, you're not into services yet, but you're trying to, trying to deal with things by having rules. Now the challenge here is a little bit like these, uh, these roads. Each car may have actually fair, more simplified rules as to what it's supposed to follow, but they can still make mistakes. You can still hit another car and then cause a traffic accident or something and then affect all kinds of other changes and cause all kinds of problems. So next thing is a huge network. So we've only doubled our number of dots here in this diagram, but suddenly it's really getting complicated. And the thing is, as this number of dots is going up linearly, the number of connections is going up exponentially, which means that the solutions that we have, they can't be ones which just uh, kind of linearly automate like a, ma a manual solution. So if you have a manual process and you create a, and you automate it, then you have an automated manual, right? But the complexity is still there. You're not actually figuring out any of these resource challenges. You still have to coordinate. You still have to run. You, you don't have any automation of any, of any of those things. So what do we need to get into? Um, well, let's think about our small stuff. Obviously, the stuff like the scripting is us right out. But even these change control stuff, you run into capacity problems. You can't make the changes as quickly as you want. If you want to do like the sustainability stuff that we're talking about, how are you going to implement that when you need to be making constant changes, adjusting, bringing links up and down in order to minimize the power usage? How are you going to, it's, it's going to be impossible to do that when you have to have some engineer responsible for that each time. So that's where we get into huge solutions, right? Service-based orchestration, automated resource management, getting APIs for everything, making the, the, the changes so there's zero touch. Right, um, so here's our, our dots again, same number of dots, but this time we have the circles, and the circles represent the service. So the thing that, um, and I think a lot of us are aware of this at least, like we've used them, we know that the services are good, but what I find really, for me, makes them fundamentally different is the fact that you can draw a circle around and you make many resources appear as one. The service takes control and handles that. It will automatically figure out you know, what, you know, you need to create a loopback for this. It creates it, it's already there. It knows it's already there. You delete all the services that use that, it deletes the loopback. It can handle those things. And it can handle things on a, on a low level in the service or, and then it can also handle the coordination, either with service or workflow for things like more global resources, IPAM and a lot, all that kind of stuff. So how do we do this? Well, if you go to like, you know, any major city in the world, you're gonna find um, some sort of a transit system, hopefully, LA notwithstanding. Um, but the, the, the ones what you, where you can get around, where you're not always stuck in traffic, they all have good transit, right? And that transit didn't appear by accident. It didn't happen because each borough decided that they would do their own transit or each, um, each, each area of the city. Um, so you have a transit authority, okay. So how, what does that look like in our networks? Well, I think a cross-organization program for automation is what's necessary. And that, the idea is this, this is gonna take these silos that we have and act as a bridge between them. The idea is not to break the silos. They exist for a reason. You don't just have you know, a 100,000 person organization that all exists as one giant, one, one giant group that somehow functions without any separation whatsoever. But you still need to have something to pull it all together, to allow everyone to work together and, and coordinate these resources. Now, if we wait for the bridge to build itself, we're probably going to be waiting for a long time. So what are we gonna do? Um, in order to do this effectively, you need to first of all have executive sponsorship. So uh, I think most of us have been in scenarios where we're trying to, you know, we're trying to push an automation solution and there is someone who's managing a network and they're like, I don't want that. 
I don't want to pay for that. I, it seems very complicated. And, and, and so the challenge is you need to have, you need to have some push from above in order to, to, to implement such a plan, right? Then, of course, you're going to actually need resources to implement, so you need to have program management. Somebody to look at all these different stakeholders, talk to each of these styles, find out what their needs are, not just push something down from above, right, but figure out what is the solution that's actually going to work. Um, and, of course, solutions architecture. You need, you need to have an actual technological underpinning that is good and is actually going to work, right? So you need, to, you need to figure that out and not, you know, I've also worked in many companies where people are pushing solutions that aren't that great and they're, they're being forced down upon you, right? So finding uh, the right technology that people know what they're talking about with technology will agree with, right? Having someone to figure out the resources of program management. And then of course you have product ownership. You know, you have to obviously not come just one dev team. You're dividing things up with different dev teams, but linking them together with the with the technology infrastructure. And then, of course, we have our dev teams. The dev team is the engine of productivity. Um, so why do I say that? I say that because, as we were talking about before, we have our, as the uh, capacity of our network is going up linearly, our uh, resource complexity is going up exponentially, which means we need development, we need services. And therefore, the amount that your network can grow is limited by the quality of your development. So if you don't have a good quality development team, you're basically going to find all your automation efforts not really working out. Um, so I say let the devs dev and let the business business. This, this ties back to when I was talking about these two different, uh, these two different uh, uh, silos that every organization has, your business side and your dev side and the importance of making sure that when a technical person understands what has to be done, they can do it. And if that has to be paid for in one way or another, obviously it has to be paid for, there has to be agreements, but that's the business's job. Because we need, the, 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 ultimately, the company is not gonna make money unless it works effectively. And it is up to the development and the operations and engineers to make that happen. And it is very, very important that the business respects that. So what makes NetDevOps special? Now, so obviously, you know, we've talked lots about NetDevOps. I'm not going to explain what it is. But I think the, the critical thing here is that network engineering is its own really hard problem. You cannot just, um, uh, it's not just, you know, describing a relatively simple concept which has to be implemented to a dev team. And the dev, and it could be hard to implement, but simple to describe. I want to have a thing that lets me watch a movie. That's yeah, simple to describe. There's a lot of technology behind it. But here, actually, what we're asking for is already a complicated thing, right? You need to have people with a lot of experience and education in order to come up with this stuff. And the output of it is also complicated. The specification of what needs to be done is, is complicated. And then you pass that to a dev team who is working with complicated software, and they have, they have to create a package, which itself will be complicated. And then you have your ops team, which needs to, needs to actually get this running. And they're responsible for having very high levels of uptime. And they have a lot of machines, and the number of machines only goes up as you get automation. So it's... it's kind of just the extra hard version of what every dev and operations team has to deal with. That's what we deal with in network. So now how can NetDevOps help automation? I'm only gonna give you a little case study. We, we are doing and have done work in mobile private network. And I just wanna talk a little bit about the challenges we had there and what our experience was. So, we got minimum 10,000 lines of configuration per device. We have a lot of change requests and northbound systems integration, and of course, extremely high reliability is required. We established three teams, which all worked together with a high degree of respect for each team. Sometimes you'll run into developers who think that they are the smart ones and the network engineers are not. It happens. <laughs> um, that is something that I think is ridiculous. 
everything that we are, are, are doing is, ha is done with the understanding that each one of these teams is doing a hard thing and an important thing. When we would have our meetings, we would do it with coordination between these teams. We would also have open chat channels. So when you're working on a, on a story, you're able to talk directly to the, the engineer who designed it or the engineer who's gonna be deploying it and ask them for feedback on how it works, ask them about the interface, whatever detailed questions are, and there will be, there always are lots, right? And we found with that open communication, plus the fact that the way our team was structured, we were basically enabled to do what we needed to do. We did not have a lot of this sort of, um, this sort of business says, oh, this is our, this is what you do. And if you don't, and you know, you're only doing support or something like that. No, we had a team that could do, ever, do whatever had to happen for that network. So that was one, that was one of the things that really helped us. Um, so here's our lessons learned, and these aren't all learned the hard way, but we, we've seen a bunch of these on, uh, talks on testing, and I wanna emphasize how important it is to make sure these tests match the real world. So going through and making sure that you're testing on real devices, and you're using automation for the tests. So sometimes, you know, you'll have a design team is coming up with a design, they test in the lab, but they've tested config configuring manually. And things could be a little different when you do it automatically because it happens a whole lot faster. There always could be bugs that will come up. Um, another thing is traffic. Some devices will not behave the same under traffic as when they don't have traffic. So even if they've tested in the lab, with, without traffic but no automation, it's still not a valid test because you need to test the whole system and make sure that it works correctly. Um, it's very important to be meticul meticulous about which calls involve which people. People's time is very valuable. So we would, uh, you know, whenever we'd have our refinement meetings, we'd always make sure we ever, only, we'd have only a few representatives from the other teams in and then we would let them go when we've, you know, gotten the feedback that we need. So whenever we're you know, talking about developing some new network feature, we, get, we have them give their information, we make sure the developers actually understand the feature well enough, not just blindly implementing a specification, and then you know, say, okay, that's great, if you wanna step out of the meeting, you can go, and then we you know, deal with whatever dev issues had popped up. Um, and then unified report to demonstrate how this net dev and ops teams are in sync. So this is just to say that essentially if you have three teams that are all supposed to be kind of working as one, delivering one objective, which is the, the, the network functionality, the ability to make your changes immediately, all this stuff, you need to make sure that that is actually being tracked and that is one of the objectives of each one of these mini silos, right? Because if it isn't, they're gonna appeal to whatever their more specific objectives are. And it'll be just like, well, I'm the dev team. My job is to make sure that whatever specs that the design team gives me, I implement, and then I'm done. I don't care if it works or not, <laughs> or whether or not the operations enjoys it. And that doesn't really work, right? Accomplishments, um, we really uh, did a lot in this. In this, We uh, were able to have a time to market improvement. Our Many, uh, we were able to make change, allow, enable the customer to make changes immediately, pretty much, as fast as they could test them and get them into NSO, they could make these changes. And that, that, uh, that would allow them to, like when they, for small changes, if it was some, and then they could pass that back to our dev team um, using Git. So they create a pull request, pass that back to the dev team. We were trying to enable them to make, do as much as possible, but uh, there was not everything that they'd be comfortable with, right? Um, then we have a s big scalability improvements. Uh, the scalability, uh, we were able to increase the size of the network and we never had to add any more headcount to any of the teams. So that, that was pretty good there. And then we have uh, security and reliability, every single thing. We did, uh, we had ability to pull in all the existing customers onto the, from the gateways and standardize them. So that was really important. Finally, here's a bit of a customer feedback. Um, I, the, we're, we're really excited to hear about the 1.4 million transactions and we are definitely working on the rest of that iceberg. 
All right, so that is the presentation. Um, I'm gonna open up, see if there's anything on Slido for me. Thanks, James. Um, I don't see anything on Slido, but my mic runners are back, so if someone has questions, put your hand up and we will run something, uh, we'll run something out. Um, otherwise, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, just going back to your point about scalability and the ability mm. to in in increase span of control without having to add people to the, right. to the network. Uh, because of what was kind of the, the just efficiency with the automation and the tools. Yeah, there. well, it, it, you know, we could, uh, when we, you know, we develop our features, we'd pass them a new version of the package, they would, they would install that, and, you know, just could just redeploy each of the gateways and get whatever changes were there, and they need to add a new gateway. We had all the, everything was automated. So you create a gateway, once it's created, you just call the package on that, that would configure everything you need, and it's up and running, right? You, so adding new gateways in was, relatively easy for such a complicated configuration, it's adding new customers, migrating them from gateway to gateway, all this sort of stuff was standardized. We also had workflow engines for doing, uh, for doing uh, like migrations, that sort of stuff. So yeah. So cookie cutter, repeatable. It's, it's all the same stuff all we've that. all been learning all, about all, all this stuff. time. We did it and it worked. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Cool. So, uh, you know, one of the trickier ones, you talked at the very beginning about getting executive air cover to help drive these kind of things. Easy to say, sometimes <laughs> trickier to do. Yes. Uh, tips or tricks, I, you know, for, for the audience in, in terms of how you approach that? Well, I think the important thing is to have a good argument to explain why things have to be done a certain way. Um, really, the reason for me giving this talk was not to convince everybody that services are good, because we all know that. But it is to maybe provide some tools and arguments for saying why this stuff is necessary and why it is essential to have this, this bridge between your silos, basically. I assume some part of that is, is being able to contextualize the argument within KPIs that your executives care about, like you use the example of, of being able to measure transaction volume mm -hmm. and you know driving up volume, keeping costs flat or, or something like right, that, yep. kind of understanding what the customer cares about and what they're measured on and, and trying to he's talk about building bridges, maybe build a bridge between this activity and the outcome. Yeah, you, you, you can prove that, dis, that, the, the, uh, that if they want to continue to increase their capacity, which they always do, yeah. um, they will have to do these things eventually. And the question is when? And Usually, the best answer is yesterday, yep. you know, but that, that's just the argument that you have to make to sh and, and show how it's not going to be possible to um, achieve what they want to do if they're waiting for each one of the silos to do it independently. Because, I mean, they, you could have the best engineers in the world in one silo, but if they're not coordinating with the others and don't have some sort of technology infrastructure to pull it all together, then... Sure. You're, you're never going to get there. And that's one of the things that jumped out at me from your, from your talk. It wasn't just technical goodness, but maybe one of the keys to success was that communication. You, talked about, you, know, you mentioned a lot about being respectful of the communications and just having open channels and, and you know, vehicles for casual interaction as well as the more formal stuff. Yeah. Uh, and that seemed almost as important as the, the, the technical solutions and, and the templates and the cookie cutter piece of this. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of the, the uh, cause we've talked so much about many, many technical sides of this and I, mm -hmm. so I wanted to have a little bit more figuring out why are we doing this and what are those arguments for doing it? Cool. Do we have questions? Yeah. So, hello. Okay. So you, as, as you talk about chatting and maybe some of the technical tools, are there some kind of administrative tools that help across these different silos? Um, really, it's the same kind of administrative tools you use for any project management. So, you know, you could have JIRA, um, you could be obviously just using emails and all that kind of stuff. Technically, you know, we have our, our standard stuff all over, Git, CI, all that kind of stuff. We have a question over here. Yeah. Hi. Uh, since you mentioned uh, that you have uh, small companies, small problems, big companies, mm. big problems, um, I have a feeling that uh, you have a need uh, uh, to standardize in between all those demands, solutions, so you can use your products more uh, efficiently. Uh, mm -hmm. So do you think about that, implement, uh, 
plan to do that. Abs absolutely. That's really what the whole idea with the architecture is, is that you're trying to fi figure out the tools. You don't want to solve the same problem multiple times in different ways. You know, uh, ZTP might be an example there where uh, the lift, you know, how it in practice works is you get different silos will solve that problem differently, but really it's the same problem. You just need to have one tool that can do it and make sure that's accessible and have, you know, people to help integrate that into every part of the company. Uh, basically, my main, main mm. question follows. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that was a pre-question. Pre uh, well, because um, uh, how hard, uh, I mean, you find the solution, right? You standardize it, you, you maybe ha ha have a variation of it uh, for the different customers, mm -hmm. but how hard is for you to, uh, uh, to, to put true to the customer that uh, your idea is really the best for them and that you don't need to tweak it, modify it, or s so that you stay in your standards. I think, Thank you. like, I mean, I'm not going to say that there's one perfect technology to solve any particular problem necessarily, but you can, if, if you know, if we have something that we're, uh, we, we've suggested, we're going to make arguments for why it's effective for them. And, uh, but it's, the, the, the thing about the de uh, development process is that you should always be open to change and you need to, your argument can only be as good as your current information, right? So obviously I'm gonna find something that is like uh, effective and can, it seems like it solves all the existing problems. You know, you talk about the problems, you figure out, okay, what has to happen, give all that and then, and then show why it will work, and then you you know get implementing and customizing whatever has to happen. If I can, if I can we'll jump, jump in on, on that a little bit, you know, as we've worked with James and Data Doctors on some on some joint customers. I, I think the one thing that may be missing is is there's a level of trust that that grows over time. So I've seen you know James on certain accounts, the customer trusts them implicitly at some point. So it doesn't there is not a a continual convincing at some point as much as uh, you know. Uh, you know, James Boone, I'm a smart guy, I know what I'm doing, I've given you good results. So at some point it says, it becomes more of, okay, what do I do next? And, and it becomes much more of a, a, you know, guidance as opposed to, you know, constantly having to, you know, make the case to why to do something. Thanks, Omar. <laughs>